charge transporting organic photovoltaic devices. Thank you very much for the introduction, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, once again, my name is Alman Pospibrigas, and uh, I'm from Linz Institute of Organic Solar Cells from Linz, from Austria. Uh, presently, I have a position, assistant professor position with uh, Professor Sergei Sarichivci. And uh, today, my topic is the charge carrier transport in uh, organic photovoltaic devices and generally in organic semiconductors. So, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our latest work and all the, all the insights of the, of the topic. And uh, I, will, I will start with a short and brief introduction of my past history, uh, where I've been educated, where I started my career. And it all started in Lithuania, in a very small country in Eastern Europe, in Vilnius University, where I did my, my bachelor and my master's with Professor Vitis Yushka, who is the inventor of CELIF, uh, the method I'll be talking about, who is becoming a world standard these days. And uh, at that time, I was an undergraduate student running around, more disturbing than helping to do measurements. <laughs> but I was participating in the process of, of developing the, the method of measuring the first measurements which were done on the, on the silicon, crystalline silicon, amorphous silicon, microcrystalline silicon solar cells. It's the first time the cell was applied. And so further on, I continued uh, in the group of Professor Ronald Osterbach in Finland. That's where I did my PhD. And uh, after that, I moved uh, to Austria. And uh, to give you the hint about the uh, sceneries, uh, Lithuania is actually mother, my birthplace. That's where I grew up. It's a very flat, flat place, a very small, small country, but uh, we have some UNESCO World Heritage Place is the very beautiful sand dunes at the Baltic Sea. So it's really the powder sand like you find in, the, in Brazil or in some uh, nice destinations. And uh, the capital, Vilnius, is also a very nice city. Uh, Finland is well known for uh, interesting people, strange people. <laughs> and very, 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 very nice people. So. Uh, it's also a very cold country, it gets, it gets very cold, it can get to minus 30 for the whole two months, for example. And uh, the place I was uh, doing my PhD is, was called Turku or Obo, and uh, it's well known for the world largest archipelago with 50,000 islands. And uh, it's, it's, it's not uncommon for a Finn to own an island, so we can have a sauna and, on the island and go for a barbecue in the evening. It's a really wonderful place. And of course, uh, the beauty of Austria, most of you probably know, all the sceneries, all the mountains, it's just magnificent, spectacular views there. So if you, if you are planning to visit one of these countries at, at any time, just let me know. I'll try to arrange uh, for you the best stay. So I'll start with the, uh, with the short motivation, why we're doing all this work. And um, uh, you already heard a lot uh, during this meeting, but... Um, uh, what I've learned recently, especially with my discussion with Dieter Meissner, for, for those of you who know him, it turns out so that, um, that the cost of the, for example, the, of the classical inorganic uh, photovoltaic module is 20% uh, is the solar cell itself. The 80% of the costs come from the glass and manufacturing costs and all the other things, but the solar cell is only 20% the total cost of the solar panel. So the only way, or the, or the reasonable way to go uh, to reducing the cost of the, of, the, of the photovoltaic is to increase the efficiency, therefore we can reduce the area, the inorganic cell. <coughs> Just uh, rephrasing the words of Alan Higer, as he told me, the, um, the biggest promise for organic photovoltaics is so we can print the whole solar cell without taking care about uh, uh, all these uh, assembly costs, uh, attaching electrodes and everything. So we just print everything together. Solar cell, electrodes, lamination, everything goes at the same time, just like the newspapers are printed in 1,000 kilometers every day. So this way, uh, we, we, we will be able substantially to reduce the costs. And so my main interest lies in the bulk hydrogen solar cells, and today I'll be talking mainly about um, about the bulk hydrogen solar cells, which we already seen in many presentations, how they look like, and uh, most common, most commonly studied um, 
organic materials as PTHD and PCBM. Uh, to start brief briefly with the uh, most important physical processes which are governing the solar cell efficiency, as you see the equation over here, uh, defining the power conversion efficiency of, uh, of, of solar cells. And um, the two, to my opinion, two most important parameters is the short circuit current and open circuit voltage. So these are the parameters which we can manipulate in the solar cells strongly, and we can either improve it or deprove it. Uh, open circuit voltage, you already heard a lot, is the maximum, actually what it is, is the difference between the quasi-fermi levels. And the maximum difference is, of course, homo as, 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 as it is correct to say. Uh, but um, another parameter is the, is the current, or the photocurrent, or the short circuit current. And here you see the equation, which shows um, that it can be either drift or diffusion-driven current. And without going into the details, which mechanisms actually dominate? Which mechanism? The drift or diffusion? So as you know, drift is electric field uh, uh, assistant process. Diffusion is the concentration assistant process. But without going into the detail, which process actually is, is dominating in which type of solar cell? It is the most important thing that in, in the both the both members we have the charge carrier concentration and, and the charge carrier mobility. So, by improving the charge carrier concentration and mobility, we can improve the short circuit current, therefore, we can improve the power conversion efficiency. And uh, let's start with the charge carrier mobility. Let's try to take a look uh, uh, on a broad overview how can we understand the charge carrier mobility in, in, in organic and in, also compared to inorganic solids. And, I like that picture when I, when I can classify the, uh, the structural property of the material. So the first thing is the, is the crystalline material, say crystalline silicon. Here we have, for example, amorphous material, amorphous silicon. Uh, one can or one, can, or one, or one cannot, it's discussable, but one can uh, put the organic, organic disordered semiconductors into, into this glass. And here we have an uh, intermediate, intermediate class of the materials is the polycrystalline material. So for example, polycrystalline silicon, microcrystalline silicon, so everything that is between crystalline or amorphous. And uh, from the past, it's well known that the charge carrier transport is completely different in all these three classes. And uh, how it is understood up to now is uh, generally we look at the energy diagrams, and here we see that um, uh, well-known classical uh, solid-state semiconductor physics. We have a conduction band, valence band, that's in, in the inorganic crystals. And um, the charge carrier transported with the ballistic transport, the charge carrier is, uh, is it undergoes a scattering event. Uh, now, if we look at the polymers, in this case, we have a completely disordered system, or, for example, one can also look at the strongly uh, strongly amorphous materials. Um, here, here, this uh, so-called we have a density of states. Uh, we should have also the second density of states for conduction band and for the valence band, but they only, only now show it for the electrons. So therefore, it, this this whole density of states would be in, in uh, correspondence with the conduction band. But the point here is that uh, all the this is the energy on this scale, and this is the concentration of the of the states. The point here is that all the states where the electron can be present, all the energies that the electron can have, they are localized. And you see that the case in between, which is actually well known for amorphous um, and microcrystalline silicon, is that uh, there is a combination of these two, that we have a localized states, localized states and delocalized states where the electron, electron work function overlaps between the two states and the uh, again, as soon as the charge carrier can be present in the delocalized states, it goes. It, it, it can be transported ballistically, but what, in, what actually happens is the trap-dominated charge carrier transport that the carriers they get getting trapped, re-trapped, re-trapped, transported, and then trapped and re-trapped again. There is also the concept of the introduced by Anderson, uh, the Anderson localization uh, or the mobility edge, which separates some of the energy energy level which separates the delocalized and localized states. So most of the time we assume that the, the charge carrier transport in uh, polymers, organic uh, materials is of this type, 
So it's completely disordered, hoping a uh, transport where the electron hops from one localized state to another without having a possibility to be transported in the delocalized states. Uh, in the crystals, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, so transport is ballistic, so electron undergoes the uh, scattering event, uh, scattering between the uh, atoms or vibrations. And um, the interesting thing, if you look at the charge here, mobility as a function of temperature. In uh, depending, of course, on the on the doping concentration, this is probably uh, those of you who are physicists who had a solid state physics course know it. Uh, mobility is uh, increasing when the temperature is decreasing because of the uh, less scattering events. So this is the well-known uh, charge transport phenomenon, well studied and uh, well understood. The question is disordered solids. How how different the charge can I transport this in these materials and where we have a the absence of translational symmetry. So it means that uh, the structures are non-periodic, they are amorphous, they are disordered. Van der Waals and the London forces are governing the interaction between the molecules. And we have the density, as already shown, the density of states is localized. Uh, in this case, as I will show you later, mobility becomes uh, strongly dependent on the charge here concentration, that is on the density on the electric field, it also depends on the temperature, Arrhenius or non-Arrhenius dependency, and also on time. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon when the, um, when the electron undergoes a thermalization, as uh, I've already heard today, heard today that if the electron acquires an edge of, for example, two electron volts, it will therm thermalize down to the, to the, to the edge of the, of the, of the, of the say, homo lumo, or it's lumo, and then it will lose this one electron ball. So uh, during this thermalization process, the charge carrier mobility slows down, and this is uh, so-called dispersive charge transport, this dispersive phenomenon. And I have a very nice picture from all Austrian Alps. What is this dispersion? And you see, all these skiers, they have started the same line, but they go with different speeds down. Whereas these guys, they're going down with the same speed. So that's no dispersive uh, down the hill rates. So, and that's the, that's the difference. So we, we will see this non-dispersive um, transport in the crystals and in the polymers and the disordered structures. We see this chaotic, chaotic down the hill, down, down hill scheme. This actually um, completely um, disturbs the, the measurement first of all, and also the device performance because um, the charge carrier mobility cannot be high due to the localized uh, states and because of the hopping transport. So I will briefly uh, show you the, the methods which are the, not the only one that I list here, but the most common ones used to study charge carrier mobility, charge carrier transport, the well-known time of flight, uh, steady state, IV, current voltage measurements, and uh, uh, all, the rest, um, all, the, all, the, all the rest of them, but uh, mainly I concentrate on the, on the self, and I will show you in a second why. Uh, Historically, though, time of flight has been the method who has been uh, used the most to study the charge current transport in, in all these uh, inorganic, organic materials. However, the difference is that why, can't we not, why can we not apply time of flight usually in our organic structures is because that the uh, organic materials contain significant amount of impurities, therefore significant amount of dopants. So these impurities that we have in the film, they result in the free charge carriers here, this would be at zero, at zero temperature, and here you see the impurities result in, this also the equilibrium generated carriers over the band gap, but it should, should not be many because the band gaps are large in, in organic semiconductors, but the impurities generate the free charge carriers, and the free charge carriers, see as they, if they are present in the film, or, or if they are here, they are participating in the electric field screening, therefore the classical time of flight is not applicable. And uh, that's actually how originally my former professor Gidi Dushka developed the self, the, the self method because uh, they've been uh, switching to study from, uh, from amorphous silicon, they've been switching to study the microcrystalline silicon. And microcrystalline silicon is, is also the material which contains a lot of free charge carriers and time of flight is not applicable. So they were using what kind of methods to use and therefore developed the self. And uh, yeah, cellular physics, of course, that's, that's the first thing that it, uh, you can study films with a uh, broad range of conductivities. 
Uh, it's very nice because we can study the material conductivity, the film conductivity, which is contact independent. So if you measure the current voltage characteristics, the contact might influence your, uh, your measurement, therefore you're not sure. But in, in this case, as soon as you have, uh, as, a, as a disadvantage, I highlight uh, one blocking electrode, so you stop the injection from the electrode, so you extract whatever you have inside there, I'll talk about it in a second, you can measure very nicely the, the film conductivity. You can also measure the carrier mobility as a function of time, so this uh, charge uh, being dispersed. Uh, this is, in principle, the only method I know which can, uh, which can give you access to the information where you can measure the mobility time dependence. Uh, well, one of the disadvantages, I will also briefly show that some rather complicated correction factors must be used when you calculate the mobility from the cell. But the basic setup is actually very, very simple. This is we don't need anything except the oscilloscope, uh, maybe laser, the sample, in principle that's all. What you do is you apply the triangle shape, the ramp voltage pulse in the input, and you measure the so-called in electronic, in electronics is called RC circuit, where the RC is the resistor and the C is the capacitance. Your sample is the capacitance, the resistance is in the oscilloscope. And you see that you measure the, the response, and from this response, you get all the information. But uh, the main idea is that um, if, you have a, if you have a film, and you have a charge carriers in the film, say, generated uh, thermally in the equilibrium, so you, by applying the voltage ramp, you start extracting the charge carriers towards the electrode, but you don't inject the new ones. All right? So this is exactly the process you see in this picture. So those are the dopants, those are immobile dopants. And those are the mobile electrons. And you see the, like, this is the electric field, that's what it's dropping in the film. So this you can think of like a shock barrier. And the electrons move uh, right, they're escaping to the electron. Therefore, and the new electrons are not injected from, so zero D is the film thickness. Okay? So new electrons are not injected because contact is blocking. Those are going away. And by measuring the time required for the electrons to go through the film, we know the field thickness, we calculate the velocity, we know the velocity, we know the mobility. So you see the method is very, very simple. Uh, however, uh, the mobility calculation requires uh, some, some kind of a constant, constant estimation, whereas uh, the other parameters like the film thickness, the A is the, the rising slope of the triangle voltage, simply this is A, so this is the, the maximum voltage divided by the pulse duration, and Tmax is the position of the maximum of the extraction maximum. So this extraction maximum is formed simply because all these present charge carriers in the film, they seem to leave the film to the electrode and the, the film becomes non-conducting. Therefore, the current drops down to the capacitive current, so this is very simple. Also, another thing is that by integrating this red area, we get the charge carrier concentration. So we can estimate from this concentration by knowing the mobility, we can estimate the film conductivity. So this is the beautiful uh, advantage of the setup that is independent. It allows you to get the access to the mobility and the concentration. Usually, most of the methods give you access to the, to, the, to the conductivity, for example. If you know the current, you know the electric field, you get the conductivity. But you have to figure out what is the concentration. For example, in field effect transistor, you estimate the concentration from the gate voltage. Okay, but the problem is that you don't know how many of these charge carriers are trapped, how many of them are mobile, therefore you are in trouble to calculate the true mobility in the field effect transistor. Okay, so this is exactly what I mentioned. Uh, this is the uh, still smoking data, which is uh, just uh, calculated uh, one week ago uh, when Professor Lushman was visiting me in, in, in Linz. And uh, here we show that those are the experts who understand, who understand CELEF a little bit. This we, sh we show here that um, uh, Apparent uh, T maximum position position must be corrected uh, with respect to the absorption coefficient and the charge carrier concentration. So I will not go into the details uh, explaining how and why, but uh, finally uh, we've been able to show this. This, te this technique is this year is 10 years old and it's also maturing. You know we understand more and more about it and since since we keep working on it. But the most important uh, statement is that uh, we are now able to correctly account, for example, for the recombination uh, if it's present during the extraction and all these things. But these are the details, so I will not bother you with that. Uh, another advantage with CELIF is that uh, it, it, it allows us to measure the electron and hole 
mobility in the films, and this is very simple. We, apl we apply the certain bias and we shine from the contact, and it's either, depending on the polarity applied, it's either, either electrons or holes move through the film. And uh, this would be the, the ultimate measurement, but also we can also use that, we can also see the appearance of two maximums in the volume photogeneration. Um, this is the nice work that we had uh, when we showed that PTHT uh, PCBM uh, solar cell, if we use the, if we use the Hemingal additive, uh, the Hemingal additive is a concept where we are able to control the film morphology of the bulk interaction solar cell. We've shown that uh, the use of this chemical additive improves the carrier mobility because the maximum from this black curve shifts towards the shorter times, meaning that mobility gets better. So, in addition, we can also conclude from this graph that also the concentration of the free carriers is also increasing. So, what it means, this is a discussion, but the fact is that mobility goes up if the nanomorphology gets better. So, it's in agreement with the efficiency measurements, it's also in agreement with the simple dark injection. You see the forward bias current is also strongly increasing. Okay, another nice thing is that we are able to plot um, uh, the charge carrier mobility as a function of uh, intensity, uh, laser intensity, concentration, and time. And this has been done here in this graph. You see that mobility is not dependent on the concentration, that's in polyxyl timing, but it's strongly dependent on the delay time. So give, this gives us some insights about the uh, uh, what actually, what's the physics that is happening in the films? Why the charge carrier mobility depends on concentration and why that is independent of the concentration, why does it depend on the time? This can give us some better understanding on the physics of the process. And this is our latest work where we show that um, uh, this is the carrier mobility estimated from CELIF and this is from the, from the OFET and this is the comparison uh, mobility as a function of concentration and you see we can, we can cover the pretty wide range. This is the only the first work we will try to fit also the, um, the gap in between. Uh, the nice work we've done with Attila, uh, when we try to measure the mobility as a function of electric field, and this is a nice, nice work when Attila showed that it's a very nice agreement between CELIF and the time of flight data. So and it also covers the broad uh, electric field range. It also gets negative mobility, but I won't go into the detail. This is a, the whole separate discussion, you can spend another hour on that. Um, the same has been done here when we compare the, again, measurements of CELIF versus OFET uh, organic field effect transistors. We can also see that, um, how does this data correspond together. Uh, one common way of also studying the charge carrier mobility is, of course, a function of temperature, and usually it's plotted in a radius plot, and as you see here, these measurements in C60 and uh, the mobility here nicely follows Arrhenius dependency. Whereas it has been, it has been shown or has been seen that in uh, polymers, the mobility depends, uh, does not follow Arrhenius plot. It actually plots, it follows one over T square plot, and there's the whole theory from Bessler, which explains why is that so. The models explaining the experimental data, which are very nice. Um, but here we, we've only shown the so-called Meyer, Meyer and Nelder rule. Uh, which is some sort of um, uh, a method demonstrating the level of disorder in the film. So by getting this, this, this energy, or this temperature, we are able to comparatively, that's what we did, we comparatively compare this Mayanella energy from CELIF, which is the measurement of mobility in the volume of the film. We compare this to the OFFET measurements, which is the transport at the interface, right, between the semiconductor and the dielectric. And surprisingly, in the inert materials, we use the BCB dielectric, which is completely inert. There's no, no any polar, no any polar, polar interfaces, nothing. Uh, we got a similar level of disorder. This energy was around uh, 45 million or so. But again, we'll, I'm not going to the details about that. Um, and for the chemists, I guess the most interesting is the um, material structure versus transport. And this is our latest work with Daniel Langbeer, where we show that. Um, Charge carrier, we have the, the backbone, the same structure, but we change the, the side chain, the, the type of the side chain, and uh, this uh, different side chains result in the different uh, pi pi stacking distances. Therefore, we see the uh, change the mobility, whereas all the other parameters during experiment were kept the same. This is also our latest work on trying to, trying to find out actually why some polymers have high mobility, why they have some low mobility. It's not yet a definite answer. 
So, just get a lifetime um, and the concentration. So, um, with the known absorption of the solar cell, we want uh, to fulfill this condition if we want to maximize our photo current. So, what it means is that the charge carrier transit time through the film must be much faster than the carrier lifetime. If that's not the case, the charge carrier will recombine on the way and it will not fully contribute to the photo current, therefore your uh, IPC or your equi will go down due to recombination. And uh, uh, I've seen already many different ways of trying to show the energy bands. Uh, I will present you one more way and I'm just wondering how many more <laughs> we will see. <laughs> but uh, instead of showing the whole rule levels, I like, to show, I like to show the density of states, as you already seen before. So the density of state distribution, and we can, we can have a donor and acceptor system, but and these are the, all the processes which are dominating in organic solar cells, all the efficiency limiting mechanisms. But I will only say that the uh, chromically bound exciton is the, is the enemy, and we want to find all the, all the, possible, all the possible methods or, the, or the find out all new ideas, how can we how can we separate this chromically bound exciton from the charge transfer state at the, at the interface? And you know, the problem is um, that um, organic materials have a low dielectric constant, it's around 4, whereas inorganic have around 12 to 15, uh, like silicon. And this results in two different types of excitons mod exciton, one year mod exciton in silicon, and Frankel exciton, strongly chromically bound exciton in uh, organic materials. And that's the whole problem. And the way I like to see it, I like to see it like this, this is the Coulomb. This is typical, uh, well known also on Zyger photogeneration model, which has been shown in, uh, in the selenium originally. On Zyger photogeneration mo model with the applied electric field, and this is we have a uh, LUMO and HOMO density of states, uh, and this is the photogenerated charge carrier. And the only way for the charge carriers to separate from each other is if the charge carrier is able to make uh, to the distance further than the critical Coulomb radius RC. Okay, so this is the requirement for the charge carriers to be separated. Otherwise, if they don't, if they don't make that distance, they will simply recombine geminately. And the problem with organic materials is that uh, the hopping distance is on the is much less than 10 nanometers. And uh, at uh, zero electric field, the Coulomb escape radius is 20 nanometers. So you see, charge carriers have, in principle, no possibility to escape each other's Coulomb attraction. Though in practice, in solar cells, we, we should have some sort of electric field at the interface. Which, which actually helps to split the excitons. Um, the strategies are, of course, to, we have to increase the local electric field between donor and acceptor. We have to use the higher dielectric constant materials because, as you see, the Coulomb radius, this is the equation defining the Coulomb radius, we have to use the higher dielectric constant materials. Of course, the separation will be more, and the, the, the Coulomb radius will be less, separation will be more efficient. And uh, yeah, high carrier mobility, for example, silicon, crystalline silicon uh, has an extremely high uh, free charge carrier generation. It has also no energy in the combination, we'll talk about in a second. Or we need a long charge carrier lifetime. And uh, these are the results uh, which uh, we have seen in uh, P3 CPCBM solar cells. So we simply took uh, astrid pair solar cell and annealed solar cell. So annealed solar cell is around 4%, something like that. And uh, here we see the IPC or the EQE data as a function of wavelength. But what is actually interesting, here we see the electric field dependence of the internal quantum efficiency. And you see here that uh, for the efficient solar cells, the internal quantum efficiency becomes electric field independent, showing that uh, actually most of the charge or the charge transfer states or most of the photo excitations is efficiently split and transported to the electrons, whereas the inefficient solar cell has a very significant dependence as has been already shown by the uh, um, So, uh, what about, uh, so to my understanding that the separation of the charge carriers has, goes hand in hand with recombination. So if we're able to split the exciton or exitplex or charge transfer state, why would they recombine away again? Why would they recombine away again? And um, the way of uh, uh, understanding the recombination is, as you see here, the uh, 
the recombination rate equation simply where you have a bimolecular combination coefficient beta. And usually it's assumed to be of Langevin type, which means that uh, the speed of the or the recombination coefficient is directly proportional to carrier mobility, which is directly constant. But uh, so one can ask the question: if we want to if we want to reduce the recombination rate for organic solar cells, we would probably like to um, improve the charge carrier mobility. But you see uh, that if the mobility is improving, the bimolecular recombination coefficient also is increasing. Therefore, the recombination rate will also increase. So this, these processes might go hand in hand, and the, the gain in mobility might not necessarily be gain in, uh, in efficiency or, or in the photocurrent. So that's the problem. And, uh, uh, we've seen that uh, some solar cells have a non langevin type recombination that is reduced recombination compared to the langevin type. And the best way to see it is simply from the Selig method. This is when you see the delta J is much larger than J0. That's at, at the highest uh, laser intensity. You are quite sure, not quite sure, you are for sure know that uh, the combination is non langevin And uh, this non langevin recombination is, is nothing new, nothing special. It's been studied in the 60s by Mott, by Martin Lampert, by Rose, by many, many famous physicists. The nice interesting thing is that if you measure the photocurrent in forward, uh, sorry, the dark injection current in forward bias, you see that the current levels are extremely high. And if you would try to compare them to the space charge limited current, which is uh, a simple understanding, defines the, the top limit of the maximum current you can pump into the material, you can see that actually experimentally, experimental data exceeds the space charge limited current. That's only experimentally, um, well, that's actually only possible when, uh, when we have the double injection, so electrons and holes get injected, and the recombination is of non langevin type. So reduced recombination, and you can read a lot about this in Mark and Lambert book, and, uh, but uh, the basic thing is here. I compare double injection with langevin recombination, so we inject electrons and holes, that's typical oil. And the efficient recombiner go give, give a bit, a bit light, and uh, it's very efficient uh, uh, injection and recombination. Whereas in non langevin recombination, in like efficient PTHD, CBM solar cells, we have the charge carrier accumulation in the film. And this uh, high charge carrier concentration gives us the high injection current uh, levels. That's why the injection current is very strong. That's how it's explained. And here I have a very nice um, simulation movie where, it's, uh, where we calculate the electron and hole density during the double injection in the film. And it's time dependent current. So uh, on this axis here we have the electron concentration, that's in blue. Here we have the hole concentration, that's in red. This is simply the electric field distribution, so if we apply some one volt to the film in forward bias, we see what happens in time. And here on this axis we have the injection current as a function of time. And as you see, in the very beginning, so this is the assumption of the calculation. This, this calculation is simply done by solving the Poisson kinetic and the continuity equation with the assumption that we have a bimolecular recombination. So extremely simple, and not, not, not many assumptions done. And in the beginning you see that the electrons, it, it's assumed also that electrons are faster than holes 10 times. And in the beginning we see that the electrons are getting injected into the film. And they're being injected and then they reach the opposite electrode. Okay, and that's exactly when the electrons reach the opposite electrode in the current kinetic, we have the uh, characteristic king. Then, Electrons are being constantly injected through the film, and the holes come in, and then the holes reach the electrode. We should have a, actually, we do have experimentally observed a very, very small king. We observe this king better if we take the, the, the derivative of the curve. And if the recombination would be of Langevin type, it's a typical recombination in low mobility materials, that, that would be it. So the current would actually saturate here and continue at low level. But what happens in the PTHD PCBM solar cells that this non langevin recombination allows for the charge carrier concentration increase here. You see, both electron and hole concentration really pumps up high, and the current and the current is still continues increasing, but then it saturates because the concentration has reached so high levels 
Now the second law, the bimolecular recombination becomes extremely fast. It's again well known fact from Margaret Martin Lapper, but uh, the current saturates to the certain level again uh, during double injection. And so um, the question the question remains uh, why some materials do show non longitudinal recombination and some do not. And um, there have been a very nice uh, uh, assembly of, 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 of the models from, from the Ladman group. And um, here we have a, a, a simple understanding for the Langevin recombination where the medium is homogeneous. So that's how the Langevin derived this equation for the, uh, I think it derived for the um, uh, collision of the gases. So process of homogeneous medium. Uh, there has been a model proposed that um, the, 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 the recombination looks non Langevin because in the p 3 HTPCBM solar cells we have different phases in donor and acceptor, so the charge carriers cannot easily mix between each other. Um, but in this case, then. Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. So, in, but in this case, if that would be the case, uh, the, still the recombination coefficient will be determined by the slower carrier mobility. And usually in this p 3 HTPCBM blends, the difference is. 10 to 100 times between the mobility ratio, right? But uh, we see that the, the bimolecular recombination coefficient, which we actually measure, it can be up to 1,000 or maybe 10,000 times reduced. So this model cannot quite fully explain that. But this model has been used uh, in um, amorphous silicon, where you see that there is a, there is a, there is a difference between the, uh, in the, in the K way, or basically, uh, the separation of the charge carriers by the in, in the in the wave vector. Uh, there is another model which which, which, which explains uh, that uh, due to the concentration differences, the charge carriers cannot be combined so easily. There is also a model from Markipov, uh, a very nice one where it shows that uh, if that's the interface here between the polymer and the and the, and the acceptor, so there is next to the next to the nearest chain model where the, the formation of the dipoles. Because we have an offset between the homo, between the homo of, 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 of these two donor acceptor, there's a formation of the dipoles at the interface, and they actually screen the electric field. So locally, we have like, like uh, we can understand it as a high dielectric constant locally, which actually screens the Coulomb attraction. Therefore, the separation is, is better, and therefore the recombination is reduced. So, which model is correct still remains to be explained. With a lot of experimental work, and I'm quite sure that uh, nanomorphology, nanomorphology here has a crucial role because uh, we see that the uh, unefficient PTHD PCBM solar cells have uh, Langevin recombination, and then efficient solar cell is non Langevin. This is, uh, but then again, if you if you over renew your solar cell, then efficiency goes down, and then recombination again becomes Langevin, and the IPC drops at the same time. Maybe the answer is the, the lamella or the pi pi stacking, which is strongly pronounced in polyx and typing. And uh, to leave you with the future, it's uh, the 7.5 and 7.4 and more, more high efficient solar cells have been already demonstrated. And uh, the interesting thing is here, as you see, that the uh, IQE is roofing on uh, almost uh, through all the entire spectra. What it actually means is that the losses. You see, it's around 10%. The losses due to recombination are extremely small. So all of, all of the light that can be absorbed is utilized for the photovoltaic conversion. And you see, I mean, this is the 800 nanometer H, so which must be much better than the HTPCBM. So, but it remains to be answered. Why is that? Why is this roofing? Is it because of the high mobility, or is it because of the um, high hormone carrier lack? So I would like to leave few acknowledgments. Thank you very much.
neutrality is uh, uh, conserved, or you, you extract the first charge and the, 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 the device becomes the same, positive. So like this picture very much, you see? Uh, those are the impurities, and those are the free charge carriers. So normally when you have those uh, under normal conditions without applying anything, there might be some kind of a short heat diode, short, short heat diode depending on the concentration of this of this dopant here. But what, ha what, what would happen if you start extracting the electrons, those uncompensated, uncompensated impurities would be left. And therefore the charge neutrality would not be neutral. And actually that's what you see in cell if, if you look at the, at the tails here, you see that the tails, you also have tails with the charge carriers that are coming back from the electron in here. So you say that this is a, a fixed, let's say, host and uh, impurity. But if you do photocell, so you have electron holes in equal amount, and you say one is faster and the second one uh, say slower, so you extract, let's say, the first, and you say this is a mobility of the, you don't know what, you assume that, mm -hmm. but they hold it still inside. That's correct. And it is drifting to contact and comes out later. Yeah. yeah. Do you see the whole, somewhere, the second, the second mobility somewhere in your transit? Yeah, here, I, not very often actually, surprisingly, but I've seen publications from other groups coming out and I've just checked uh, and I found one that it was LVP of 5 from Ole Ingen, that's, that's the collaboration from uh, in Finland. And we have done some PTHD, PCD, and solar cells, and we actually saw these two maximums here. So there's one, and there's another one. But we cannot really for sure say, I cannot really for sure say, what is this electrons here or the holes here, because at that time I didn't do, didn't do this kind of measurement, because this would be the ultimate measurement. Make a thick solar cell, where the film thickness and the alpha D, alpha D parameter, so that the film thickness is much larger than the absorption, absorption depth. Right? So if absorption depth is say 200 nanometers, we can make a film of uh, 20 nanometers or, or micrometers or, or 2 micrometers and then you can probe, you know, by changing the polarity, electrons and holes and then you can see. We've done this in the C60 lately and we, we saw that uh, in C60 the whole mobility is, is much worse than the electron. But, but yes, from, uh, from the volume, from the, from, from the operation of devices, it's very difficult to measure. I don't expect to see the difference of, you know, 100 times in this case, you know. The, the, the thing is that we observe uh, 10 to power 4 difference. And uh, this, this bit over detail is then changing 10,000 times. If you anneal the cell and if you don't anneal the cell. This is a really strong difference, which would not, I would not expect that uh, 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 strong difference depending on uh, at which, you know, at which voltage I'm trying to measure. But yes, it's a strongly changing the morphology. My, my question relates to perhaps first related to what Paul was asking. Intermediate cases when there is you have lunch with combination and you have very strong neuron lunch with like this ratio. Intermediate cases where you might have a combination of say monomolecular or dispersive, bimolecular and the bimolecular on the top. Uh, which method do you, do you have to use? Because so this is an intermediate case. This is exactly the intermediate case. We see that delta J is not much larger than J0. It's sort of, I don't know, five times maybe. That's exactly the intermediate case, you know, so. Uh, now, I, I don't know. This is the, we have, we have developed this theory now how to, how to, how to estimate the uh, recombination, recombination from cellular by using delta J or J0, but I don't remember now 
know exactly how to trans transform it to beta over beta L, but but I mean if it's a, if it's a beta over beta L ten thousand times, I would expect delta G to be much larger than G zero. But we have this kind of situations. This is particularly the blend of uh, polyfluorine with PCBM. If that answers your question. Yep. Your uh, carrier mobility seems to be very, very similar to those determined by microwave conductivity. Do you think that's a coincidence, or do you think that's uh, a coincidence? <laughs> well, the microwave conductivity probes more like local mobility within the domains, right? Right, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but um, this, uh, uh, these cells are highly efficient. They are like 4%. These TPC cells are highly efficient. And uh, I've seen that mobility strongly goes down if you if I over anneal the cell, for example, or if I if I don't anneal the low, the mobility is at ten times. So what what would you say the mobility the electron mobility is in PCBM? In the pure PCBM. In the pure PCBM. Well, that's the funny thing because I I was not able to measure it because to make a PCBM film it, it's pretty difficult. <laughs> you know because um, one can spin code it, um, very thin one. But that's become difficult to measure because the mobility is higher than the thickness allows to measure. So, for example, I can spin 100 nanometers thick PCBM. But the mobility is, is, uh, is so high, I mean, it's, it's faster than 10 to minus 3 for sure. So, I cannot electronically measure, I'm limited with a nanosecond time. In mm -hmm. a hundred of nanosecond time scale, I cannot measure. So, I have to make a thicker film, and this becomes a problem because it really crystallizes. So, I have to maybe, I can, I can deposit it. But C60, I have, a, I have a nice data on C60. Uh, actually, I, I will show it here. And C60 mobility is 0 0.1 or, or 0 0.5. Like here, for example, yeah. Yeah. And so if we have the, yeah, 0 0.1 and from Moffat we have around a little more than one. Yeah. So that's 0 0.5 is near identical to what I've measured in, actually in PCBA. Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice to compare this yeah, to this system, yeah. yeah. I hope it is not a coincidence, because that would be really useful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we're going at 5 o'clock, I've been asked that we have 15 minutes for discussion with all the speakers, so why don't we keep the time, and uh, thank you for speaking.